chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, I'll read verses 3 through 11 as we continue on on our journey through the first epistle of John, and if you're there, would you stand with me please, 1 John chapter 2, I'll read verses 3 through 11. The Bible says, and hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, as we look at this today, I would love us all just to have, have a time of self-evaluation, Lord, where we really realize whether or not we know you, whether or not we really are saved. And then, Lord, we look at these guideposts in the scripture that tell us whether or not we are saved. And, Lord, if we see any shortfall, Lord, that we might uh, re just surrender that right to you, whatever it is we're holding back so that we can truly act, live, speak like a Christian ought to. So bless this time. We'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Heard a funny story of a high school football coach who was coaching his team, and his team was down with, by about six points. He was getting toward the end of the game, and the clock was quickly running out. The other team had the ball and they were trying to run the clock out as good as they could. They made a throw and it got intercepted. And so the team that was down, they actually intercepted the ball and they ran it all the way down to the five yard line and they were stopped there. And so there's still some time on the clock, there was hope. And so the coach called in a play to the quarterback. He told them to do a 39 sweep. And so the quarterback ran the play and the team was stopped. And so he called in another play. He said, okay, run a 36 sweep to the other side. And so they tried that, and again, it was stopped. And so the coach called another play. He said, all right, let's have a quarterback keeper up the middle. And the quarterback went, and he got stopped as well. The coach got so frustrated, he threw down his clipboard, and he turned his back to the game, not making another call. All of a sudden, he heard the roar of the crowd, and he turned, and he saw that his team had scored and they'd won the game. And he ran into the quarterback and he said, what play did you call? He said, coach, I didn't know what to call. You didn't give me a call. He said, but we were sitting there in the huddle and I saw number 10 standing there and I saw number 13 standing there in front of me. And so I just added those numbers together and I called a 24 cross trap and it worked. And the coach looked at me and said, son, 10 plus 13 does not equal 23, it equals 20, or, yeah, it doesn't equal 24, it equals 23. And the quarterback just said, gosh, coach, I guess if I was as smart as you, we would have lost the game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it's not what you don't know, right? Uh, the truth of the matter is, what you don't know can hurt you sometimes. In that case, it didn't hurt. In that case, it helped. But when it comes to knowing Jesus Christ and whether or not you truly are a Christian, that is something that God wants you know, to know for sure. Some people you ask, are you a Christian? And you get all kinds of responses. They'll say, I think so. 
Some will say, I hope so. Do you realize that God wants you to have a I know so type of answer to that question? In fact, 27 times in the five chapters of 1 John, that word know appears. There's only 95 verses in the epistle of 1 John. That would mean that one out of every third or three verses in the book of 1 John is the word know. God wants you to know. He wants you to have the truth that Jesus Christ died for you deep down in your heart, and he doesn't want you to doubt it. He wants you to have a no-so type of Christianity. Now, we live in a day and age where social media has sort of hijacked truth. Yeah. And some people think just because it's written out there that somehow it's true. Well, can I say that's, that's not how truth is governed, amen? But the same thing can happen in the Christian life as well. People can say that they are Christians when they really aren't Christians, and it's still not the truth. If I said, I'm a tree. Look at me, everybody. I'm a tree. Would that make me a tree? What if I put on a costume so I look like a tree? You'd probably say, just go ahead and leave right now. <laughs> but even if I look like a tree, and I try to convince you that I was a tree, that would not make me a tree. And the reason for that is because the inner nature isn't there. I don't have the inner nature of a tree. And so people can go around today and they can say, I'm a Christian all they want to. They can even use the Christian jargon of, I'm praying for you, and God bless you. Oh, and isn't that wonderful? God's so good. And you can say all those things, but we're reminded in Matthew chapter 7 that there was a bunch of folks that came up to Jesus and even called him Lord, Lord. But he said, depart from me. I never knew you. You see, God has to... Uh, I hear the word from you. I know him. I know I'm a Christian. There's a certain thing that I've done to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And so I want to ask us today to do three tests. Who likes tests? <laughs> you love tests? We got one back there. Isn't it? All right. Uh, so we're going to have three tests today, whether you like it or not. Amen. You can like it or lump it, is what I heard somebody say once. Here's three simple tests that we just read in this passage and see if you pass, see if you really are a Christian. All right? Number one, the commandment test. The commandment test. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. The Bible says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Here it is again. Hereby know we that we are in him. So the Bible says that you can pass this test and you'll be able to say, I know I'm a Christian simply by keeping the commandments of God. So I've got to ask you, as part of this test this morning, do you keep the commandments of Jesus. That's hard, isn't it? It's like, wow. How many are there again? I'm not sure if I've kept them all. I wonder if I'm a Christian. I think the truth of the matter is, right now you probably feel like a bit of a failure since I just asked you that question. And I want you to understand that nobody's perfect. Amen? But there's something that happens upon salvation. And what it is, is that God gives us a new desire. Yes. He gives us a new desire. And so when we're asked that question, are you keeping the commandments of God? We can realize and think to ourselves, well, nobody perfectly keeps all the commandments of God. But right here, pointing to myself, you found somebody that has a desire to keep the commandments of God. 
And can I tell you, before I met Jesus, I didn't have a desire in my heart to keep the commandments of God. I had a desire to do what I wanted to do. But part of the proof that I am actually a Christian now, that I believe in him, is the fact that I've got this new want to that's going on. I've got this heartfelt desire inside of me where I truly want to obey my God every day and in every way. Are you that way? You know, there's 613 Old Testament written commandments. And you say, well, we're not under the law. We're under grace. Praise the Lord. Amen. And there's two really big laws that Jesus brings out, or commandments, should we say, in the New Testament. Can you remember what they are? Love the Lord with what? Heart, soul, and it's either mind or mind, depending on which passage you're looking at. And to... Love your neighbor as yourself. So if we just took those commandments, how you doing? Oh, man. I ought to have a desire, though, to love God with everything within me. And there ought to be some evidence in, in me and in you, something that wasn't there before, that's in there now, where you don't want to disappoint him, and you've got a kind of a supernatural, strange love for other people that call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ, and that wasn't there uh, before, but it is there now. Amen? Amen. You realize there's 1,050 commandments in the New Testament. Somebody said there's 73 that begin with B. They're the B's. Let me give you 10 of them. Be thankful. Be tender-hearted one to another. Be patient. Be of good cheer. Be transformed. Be baptized. Be angry and sin not. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be of one accord. Be ye doers of the word. Now that's just 10 of those 73 bees. So there's another swarm of 63 bees out there, if you will. But let me ask you this morning, how many of those 1,050 commandments did you keep last week? Because that's evidence. As to whether or not you are a Christian. You feel condemned yet? You feel condemned? I mean, this is the standard. This is the bar. We're not just to live like everybody else. And we're not just supposed to add Jesus to the mantle of all the other gods like the Hindus do. But we're supposed to clear that mantle off. Have the Lord Jesus Christ up there. And have as proof to the world that we're a believer in him. By keeping his commandments. And that is having that desire to want to do it all the time. And there is no condemnation if you fail if you fall and fail to keep them all the time. But there ought to be a desire there now. Amen? Amen. So he gives me a new desire. He also gives me a new devotion. See, before salvation, I was running towards sin. I was running towards self. I was running toward my will. I was running toward my flesh. I was running toward what I wanted to do. But when I got saved, I repented. That means my mind changed, my heart changed, and my actions changed to face only to the Lord Jesus Christ. To the exclusion of everybody and everything else. I am now trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And so the, instead of the world, the flesh, and the devil being my master, now the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that I want to love and I want to obey. I have a new devotion now, a new desire to please Him and keep His commandments. Are you that way? And we said in our bulletin, our greatest desire should be to obey and to serve Jesus. That should be our greatest desire. Now we all know that in the past, the early Christians experienced great persecution. I mean, they were many times thrown to wild animals and killed that way. And it was often recorded that these early Christians had a, a, a cheerful heart about it. And went out, if you would, with a song on their lips. Still praising God, devoted to their God. I heard it of Roman Emperor Domitian and how he was looking for ways to harm 
Christians back in the day and how they had found one early pastor and they desired to, to harm this pastor in the greatest possible way that they could think of. And Emperor Domitian, he had his advisors around him and he said, uh, I know what we'll do, fellas. We'll just take everything that he owns so he doesn't have any possessions. And the advisor looked at the emperor and he said, that's not going to work. He's a Christian. You see, Christians, they seem to give up all their rights to everything. And they talk about having heavenly treasures, so that's not going to work. And so Domitian said, he said, all right, well then how about we, uh, 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 let's put him in solitary confinement. That's what we'll do. We'll take him away from everybody and we'll put him in a place all by himself. The advisor said, no, that's not going to work either. Uh, they, I've heard that those Christians... They have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. They have a, a Lord God that says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And so uh, he'll just end up praying to that God. So that won't work. Well, I know then, Domitian said, I'll kill him. I'll just kill him. And uh, the advisor said, that's not going to work either. Because for the Christian, uh, death isn't something to be afraid of. Death is like a graduation. Death is when they get to see their Jesus face to face and they talk about having a heavenly home and a mansion in the sky. And Domitian at this point just said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do then. And the advisor leaned forward in his chair and he said, if you really want to harm this Christian pastor, he said, then you make him sin. You make him sin. Because that ought to tear up a Christian more than anything. And that does. You've got to think, as a believer, you've got a new devotion. And the flesh isn't to be worshipped anymore. And it's not your master anymore. You've got a new devotion, a new pledge, a new love. And there's a desire in your heart now. And a devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, inside all of you, you want to obey your master. How do you do so far on your test? That's the first test. The second test is... The consistency test. Look at 1 John chapter 2, if you would, in verse 6. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. Let me ask you a question here this morning. How consistent is your walk with the Lord? How consistent is it? Uh, the apostle uh, John was just so bold, wasn't he? He said, if, if any of you say that you're a Christian and you don't have a consistent walk with God, he just, he just said, you're a liar. Can you imagine walking up to somebody today who said they're a Christian and they're not living right and then point your finger in their face and saying, you're a liar. That's what John did. He said, your walk is not measuring up with your talk. You're saying you're something, but it's not really adding up with, with what's true here. Do you live and talk the same on Monday through Saturday as you do on Sunday? We can all dress up and we can look the part and we can talk the part on Sunday and we can say, God bless you, dear sister. I've been praying for you. But the truth of the matter is, is there a consistent walk throughout the week? Amen. He said, that's how you know. That's how you know. You know who we can look to to stay consistent, don't you? Our example. Our example. They say that most successful people in this world had somebody as an example. They looked up to that person. And you talk to successful people today and you say, how did you, how did this, oh, what? Explain this to us. And they'll always point to somebody. When I was younger, I was like most Canadian boys. I wanted to be a hockey player. Ice hockey was everything. And so I lived a 
hockey, I breathed hockey, I ate hockey, I slept hockey, I dreamed about hockey. When I was in religion class at the Catholic school, I would sign my name and put number 16 or number 17. I had my number all figured out and my autograph all figured out, how I was going to write it on my rookie card and my playing cards. And, and uh, I had players like Brett Hull that I looked up to. Boy, the first time he played on the Calgary Flames, he came off the bench, he got the puck at the center line, he took a slap shot when you know it sailed through the air and it rang off of the crossbar of the net and it pinged so loud that every, everything went quiet. I mean, the announcer went quiet, everybody in the stands was just quiet. It was like, wow, where did this shot come from? This guy, he, he's, oh yeah, he's, he's Bobby Hull's uh, son. That's who it is. Uh, uh, the Golden Jet. Now we got the Golden Brett. And boy, I looked up to him, and I looked up to Wayne Gretzky, and I looked up to Mario Lemieux, and I thought, I want to learn to shoot like you, and I want to learn to skate like you, and I want to learn to pass like you. And they were my examples. Can I say we got a better example? That's Christian. We have the Lord Jesus in our memory verse this week. 1 Peter 2.21 For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Amen. How are you doing on the consistency test? You know, parents ought to be role models to their children. But that doesn't always work out so well. I remember on Father's Day when I was just, I don't know, seven years old or so, we were visiting some friends, and uh, we were told to go outside and play so my parents could enjoy fellowship with their friends. And So we went outside and took the soccer ball with us, and we were playing in the street, kicking it back and forth to each other, and, and it rolled under this guy's car. Well, this guy was apparently watching us, and he came outside and he grabbed the ball, and he went inside his house with it. We ran after him, mister, mister, that's our ball. He said, you're kicking it near my car, you're not getting it back. He thought, oh, yeah. Hey, Dad, Dad. And uh, we ran into our friend's house, and my dad said he would. And uh, he came outside. At which house is it? It's that house right there, Dad. And uh, we just stood back, and we let Dad walk up to that door. My dad's, he's pretty short, he's about this tall. And he walked up to the door, and this giant of a man comes up the door, and my dad was like this, and he looks up and he said, I heard you took my, my ball, uh, the, the, son, the ball off my son. He said, yeah, they were kicking it by my car. What you going to do about it? My dad said, well, I'm going to get it back. That's what I'm going to do. And the guy said, you're too short. You can't do anything. Next thing I knew, they were rolling on the grass. My dad punched him in the face. And the, my dad's friend, he said, come on, James, and come on, Mark. And they're ushering us to the house. We got our ball back. My dad didn't have any bruises, so I don't know what happened there. But you, would you know, I wanted to imitate my dad. I wanted to imitate my dad. And there's not much he could say when I got my first fist fight. <laughs> Let's be a role model. The Lord Jesus Christ is our example. We're supposed to consistently line up with the way that he acts, the way he talks. So what should our experience be? Well, look at the verse. He also suffered for us, leaving us an example that what? Ye should follow his steps. Follow his steps. Now, a few years back, Charles Sheldon, he wrote a book called In His Steps. It's about a group of people that decided to take the challenge of living for God seriously. And living like real Christians should live. And they decided when they got to a, a, a T in the road, a junction, if you will, where they had to make a moral decision, that they would ask themselves the question, what would Jesus do in this scenario? And can I say, that's a pretty good question to ask ourselves when we come to a moral juncture and we're not sure what we'll do. We look to our example and we ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? And can I say, that's not only a great question to ask yourself, but it's also a great starting point and only a starting point. Because you can pretty soon realize that the Lord Jesus Christ abides within you right here. 
And you can follow his steps just by yielding to him in those situations. Yes. Lord, what would you do through me? Lord, what would you have me say? Lord, how would you have me act? How are we doing on our second test? Mm -hmm. How's your consistency? How are you doing on the first test? Following his commandments. Number three test here. That compassion test. That compassion test. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 10 says, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. You see that? It's not necessarily talking about the heathen. It's not talking about the lost world. But it's talking about other Christians. He that loveth his brother or his sister abideth in the light. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because that darkness has blinded his eyes. Now John's talking here about two different experiences. Walking in the darkness and that's a life filled with hatred. Boy, what an opposite. What an extreme. But the only opposite to actually walking in the light. Because the other experience he talks about is somebody who claims to be a Christian that is walking in the light. And it's a life characterized by loving other Christians. You say, I don't know if it says it that clearly. Listen to this verse then. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. See that? I know I'm a Christian because I have a supernatural love for other Christians all the time. Mm. We know we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. That's pretty stark. You see, salvation is when you cross a line. You cross a line from darkness to light. You cross a line from death into life. You cross a line from lostness into being a saved person. You cross a line at salvation. And it, it's an actual event that takes place. Some people want to look at me and say, You know what, preacher? I think I've always been a Christian. That's not what the Bible says. Not according to the Bible. You could never have always been a Christian. In fact, there was a time where you had to have been lost. And a time where you realized that you were lost. And you were a sinner. And on your way to hell. But then you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And at that moment you crossed over. You crossed a line that divided you from darkness to light. From death to life. From hatred to love. Isn't that interesting? One of the ways you can know that you've crossed that line is you have an agape love. That's real easy to talk about loving somebody. It's a lot harder to actually love somebody. There's a poem that says, To live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with folks we know, now that's a different story. <laughs> you know, some people say, You just don't know my family. You just don't know my family, preacher. You just don't know my neighborhood, preacher. You don't know my neighbor. You don't understand. Oh, you just you just don't know the school that I'm going to, preacher. This person, and you can put your whatever name you want in this blank, they are unlovable. This person is unlovable. You think anybody like that? The truth of the matter is there is nobody like that, ladies and gentlemen. There is nobody in the world that's unlovable because Jesus loves everybody. For God so loved the world. And we're not talking about the rocks and the trees and the ants. Heavens knows we're not talking about the ants. Amen. We are talking about humanity. For God so loved humanity. That's people. There is no unloved person in this world. Now there are unlikable people and there are unlovely people. But there is no unloved person in the world. And part of the evidence of you knowing that you're a Christian is... I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a supernatural agape love. Isn't that interesting? Got some things to work on? Mm -hmm. Preaching to myself. 
The opposite is hate. 1 John 2.11 But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness. That is a strong word. Talk about hate speech and hate crimes. I don't think hate is always an aggressive action. Hate can also be passive. You know, you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we call it the love chapter. And in it are the characteristics of love. I want to reverse that for a second and give you the characteristics of hate. Tell me if any of these apply to you. Hatred is impatient. Hatred is mean. Hatred is jealous. Hatred is boastful. It's proud. Hatred is rude. It's selfish. Hatred gets angry easily. Hatred keeps a record of every wrong. Hatred delights in evil and rejoices in lies. Hatred hurts. Hatred mistrusts. Hatred gives up on people. Hatred always fails. It's extreme, isn't it? You have any of that in you? How do you do on the test? How about the commandment test? Do you have a desire to obey God? Can you put a check on that test? How about the consistency test? Does your walk match your talk? How about the compassion test? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Give yourself a grade. He's grading you. Give yourself a grade. When I was in grade 11, I signed up for the rugby team in our high school. And I thought I'd found my favorite sport in playing ice hockey all my life. And then I got on a rugby pitch. And I thought, man, this is a whole other level. This is wonderful. <laughs> I love this. We had 11 players either side and only one ref to try to, you know, corral us. Mm -hmm. And we just had so much fun out there. It was great. Got to play rugby and loving it. My rugby coach was also my English teacher. I was sitting in an English test one day in grade 11. And I hadn't studied. I didn't know the answers. So I raised my hand in the middle of the test. And my English teacher, who's also my rugby coach, he came back. And I said, I don't know what this means. And he said, I'll give you the answer if you score a try tonight. <laughs> he did. I said, okay, I'll try. He gave me the answer. He was the best English teacher ever. <laughs> <laughs> See, we can be failing these three tests. But when he helps us through them, we want to go out and live for him. I wrote that test, handed it in, I thought, boy, I know I got one right, amen? <laughs> that night I put on my uniform, I didn't tell anybody, but I wanted with all my heart to win for my coach. And you might be failing in these three areas, maybe didn't give yourself a very good grade and you were honest. But let him come alongside you. Let him help you. That's what he wants to do. And then go out and win for him. Go out and live for him. Go out and truly let him help you in every situation. And pass the test. And pass the test. And pass the test. And with him, win the game. Amen. Are you a Christian today? Are you a Christian? Have you trusted Christ? Would you stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? Only you can answer that question. Are you a Christian?
I didn't ask you if you're raised in a Christian home. That doesn't make you a Christian. I didn't ask you if you've been baptized. That doesn't make you a Christian. I didn't ask you if you sit in church regularly. That doesn't make you a Christian. I asked you, are you a Christian? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? He's already done all the work on the cross. He's paid for your sin and my sin. But you have to trust Him as your Savior. You have to ask Him to forgive you of your sins. And you have to trust Him as the Savior of the world. There's no other way, Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Are you a Christian? And if you are, my friend, are you passing the test? Are you passing the test? As the piano plays this morning, this altar's open.